Um, and I, I stole this picture from that website that no longer is up, but remember I I um, posted the file for y'all and I, I wanted y'all to read it. And, and those of you guys that have read it um, but haven't posted your two comments, please do that soon, right? Because I'm probably going to be on a grading spree this weekend um, to get caught up on things I haven't graded yet that you put in and the computer won't grade, but I have to. Um, so... Um, we're going to move on to the cells, right? And so they have these cute little, right, uh, cartoons on that on that page I wanted you to read uh, from a website. And uh, I stole some of their pretty pictures because they're, they're cute and they help us remember. Uh, but if you've taken anatomy and physiology, uh, you've probably looked at stained red blood, uh, excuse me, stained white blood cells, right? and red blood cells, right? But all we care about in immunology is the white blood cells because they're part of your immune system. Uh, and you may have learned this cute little um, mnemonic, never let monkeys eat bananas. And that's to help you remember the five different classes that we look at under the microscope of white blood cells. Um, so neutrophils are the most abundant which makes sense because remember when we have inflammation, they're going to be the ones we call to the scene. And these guys are really good killers. Part of the reason is that they have vesicles inside of them. They call them granules. And the reason why these guys are called neutrophils is because their granules are actually neutral staining. You don't usually see them in the cytoplasm. Uh, but their nucleus becomes multi-lobed, right? See how it's in pieces? where most of the time the nucleus of a eukaryotic cell is this nice round looking thing. And they all stain purple, right? With the stain that we use, the Jensen stain um, that's used for staining white blood cells. Um, it's a combination of, of stains uh, in that mixture. And they'll stain, the, the nucleus will come out purple for all these cells. Um, the cytoplasm of these, depending on the stain, will look kind of orangey, right? But usually if you see a multi-lobe nucleus under the microscope, you're looking at a neutrophil because, again, they're the most abundant in normal blood. When you have inflammation, these numbers go up. And this is why doctors sometimes when you're sick, and machines do this now, I used to do this by hand, where we literally would take blood, spread it out on a microscope slide, stain it, look at these guys under the microscope, right? And now they have like apps on your computer, but I had, you know, uh, a little counter thing where I, like, you know those clicker things, right? But mine had five different buttons and it would ding when I got to a hundred, right? So I would count a hundred cells. I would identify a hundred cells, right? And then that would give me my percentage, right? Now you can do it on a little app on your phone. Right? And, it, and, and it too will make a noise when you reach 100, right? Uh, but usually you're looking at it so you see. Um, I got so good it was almost like typing on a, on a computer, right? I, I, I had my fingers on it and was clicking away as I was scanning under the microscope. Uh, but yeah, these numbers are going to change depending on what type of inf in, infection you're dealing with, right? Especially with bacterial infection, when you have inflammation, neutrophils are going to go up, right? So are monocytes, because remember, um, these are called macrophages when they move into your tissue. These are the big eaters, right? So they're in your tissues, and more are going to come via the blood. When they're in your blood, they're called a monocyte, though. The second most abundant in your blood under normal conditions are lymphocytes. But we have three different types of lymphocytes. Anyone know? The three different types of lymphocytes are actually abbreviated by letters, right? T cells, right, which are divided into two main subsets, helper T cells and cytotoxic T cells we're going to talk about. These guys are part of your adaptive immune response, right? Lymphocytes are, are the add-on guys. And then natural killer cells fall into this category as well. But under the microscope with this stain, you can't differentiate these three different cells from one another. These guys are going to have a huge nucleus, nice round usually, and very light blue cytoplasm. And about the size of a red blood cell in comparison. Monocytes, as you can see, 
are going to be the next abundant, but you still have to kind of usually scan around for them because you're going to see three to eight per 100 cells you look at. They're really large. Sometimes their nucleus, right, will get an uh, indentation in it or even become horseshoe shaped like this. Notice neutrophil, eosinophil, basophil. These all fall into the category we call granulocytes because they're all named after the fact that they have vesicles inside them that stain. Granted, neutrophils are named after the fact that theirs neutrally stain, so they kind of blend in with the cytoplasm, where eosinophils are named after the fact that theirs stain with the eosin dye in this mix. Eosin dye is a reddish dye, so they, it, they, it, they're usually red to orange in color, like you'll see all these little dots on the inside. And then also notice that their nucleus is multi-lobed for both, for all of these, right? Neutrophils most often, right? Eosinophils and basophils. Always have that dis distortion where they say it's lobed. Eosinophils are usually pretty easy to find right? Basophils are next to impossible to find in normal blood. Look at this. You might be lucky if you see one in a hundred. Half of one. <laughs> I don't even know why they put that. It makes me laugh, right? You're not going to find half of a cell. <laughs> but, you know, um, this one is named, basophils are named after the fact that they stain with the basic dye. I can't remember which basic dye it is, but they'll be purple. And so the the nucleus is purple, their granules are purple, it looks like this purple granular mess, right? And in anatomy physiology too, right, especially if you look at these cells under oil immersion, which you really should when you're looking at these cells, so you can see their nucleus and granules real well. Beginning students will say, oh, I've got a basophil, and I'd say, yeah, if it's really a basophil, you will see me do my happy dance. In all the years I used to teach anatomy and physiology too, I never danced, y'all. I never thought that what the student was looking at was truly a basophil, okay? Um, I keep telling them they need to order some disease slides, you know, where the numbers are up for basophils, right? So you will see them. Uh, most of the time, guess what it was, probably? A lymphocyte. Because the nucleus itself will look granular, but what you've got to look for is that little tiny light blue cytoplasm. And so most of the time when I looked at it, I was like, y'all look at this again, right? I see light blue cytoplasm. It's a lymphocyte, right? So I always say, go ahead and argue with your AMP, and they'll come back and be mad at me, but go ahead and argue with your AMP2 teacher. If they think that under the microscope they're showing you a basophil, I want to see it. I call bullshit, right? It's probably a lymphocyte with the cytoplasm not very visible, right? So... I always say draw it out and ask your teacher questions while you're taking the test because you're allowed to do that, you know. If you're not sure, right, draw what you see and say, this is what I see and this is what I think it is based on what I see, right? Me, I'd always pull out the model for this one, right, instead of the under the microscope. Uh, not to mention, you know, as you move down, it's harder to find these things. And like I said, I don't think you're going to find it. Not in normal blood anyways. So th this is what it looks like under the microscope, a neutrophil. So in this case, it's kind of a purplish color, but sometimes it'll be orange, right? But you can't really see the granules, but you can see that multi-lobe purple nucleus, right? And these guys, your neutrophils, and these are transmission electromicrographs, right? So this is not under the light microscope. But you can see the nucleus sometimes is horseshoe shaped. You can see they're really large cells. And they have vesicles too, granules, right? Um, that we'll talk about are important for phagocytosis. Um, but they don't show up when, under the light microscope when you do the normal white blood cell stain, right? Um, so they're referred to as A granulocytes, right? Oh, and this is a trick, look. All their names that have granules end in fill. You see that? Because probably because they're filled with granules. Isn't that cool? Right? Little trick to help you out in remembering the different names. Um, 
Yeah, so I don't like that name, but yeah, they use it. Okay, so notice we say monocytes and macrophages, but they're basically the same cell. Monocyte is the name given to it in your blood, right? Macrophage is the name given to it when it's in your tissue. It's the same cell, right? All of these guys will engulf by phagocytosis if they can recognize it, any foreign matter. So how do they become activated? How do they start no to eating stuff? Well, they have to know that the bad guys are present, right? So remember, we have complement protein, C3B, that can bind and let us know that it's an uh, invader. We have antibodies, which are a product of our immune system, our adaptive immune system I'll talk about. We have mannose binding lectin that we've already talked about innately. We make this. It'll bind to mannose and let us know that, say, a bacteria is present. We have C-reactive protein that will bind. And guess what? Our phagocytic cells have receptors for all of these things, right? They have a receptor for C-reactive protein. They have a receptor for mannose binding lectin. They have a receptor for C3B. They have a receptor for antibodies, for this portion of the antibody that we call the FC portion, right? So this is the, the fraction that crystallized when they were studying antibodies. But this bottom part, right, we have receptors for it. So if there's a bacteria with any of these things stuck on it, and we call this process when we tag them for destruction, what? Starts with an O opsonization, right? When they've been opsonized, right, by any one of these things, and helps the phagocytic cell attach to it, recognize it as being foreign, and it's literally going to engulf it and destroy it, right? So um, these are pattern recognition receptors, right? They recognize patterns. Um, cytokine signaling is going to, right, turn on this, right? They're going to talk to each other. They're going to release chemical messages that say, let's become killers, right? Because the bad guys are here. But first of all, we have to know that they're there. So these are our two main killers, right? So I like this one. Look, <laughs> his granules are freckles. Isn't he cute? Right? So that, that's our cute little neutrophil. And then look at that macrophage. Boy, he does look like a big eater. Look at those teeth. I'm afraid right? <laughs> What's the difference between these two? And remember, monocyte is in our blood, macrophage is in our tissue. And the problem is when we first started studying tissues and things like that, they saw these cells in tissues. So they gave them names. Like Kufer cells in the liver, y'all, it's just a macrophage in your liver, right? The good news is by the time we got to the lungs, they call them things like alveolar macrophages to denote it's a macrophage in the lung. <laughs> um, but yeah, they're scattered all throughout your body, right? Um, as we saw in the picture, they can sometimes have that horseshoe-shaped nucleus, right? They're very large cells. They contain lysosomes. Lysosomes, you can guess, right? These are vesicles, and what's the most common substance inside of them? It's how they get their name. It's lysozyme. Both these guys have this, right, in their lysosomes, in these vesicles, or we call them granules for neutrophils. What does lysozyme di do? What does lysozyme do? It's an enzyme, right? It, it degrades something that bacteria have. It degrades peptidoglycan. Oh, yeah, it's an important one. Write it down like four times. Okay. It's on the test. I kid you not. Right? Okay. Um, <laughs> we've been talking about it, too, since the beginning of the semester. You just don't realize it. Okay, because we've talked about a lot of stuff. So, again, their granules are neutral staining, which is why they're called neutrophils. And the nucleus not shown in this picture is multilobed. Uh, they're the most abundant, right? Never let monkeys eat bananas. N is for never, for net neutrophils, right? Um, and they're going to be the first to arrive during inflammation from the blood. Macrophages, remember, are already there. The first white blood cells 
to additionally come there are going to be the neutrophils. And really, neutrophils only are going to be found in your tissues when you have inflammation. Okay? And then more macrophages are going to come, and if we need it, lymphocytes are going to come, right? B cells and T cells are going to come on C. So these are some of my favorite videos, um, and, and, they, and, and some of them have little um, music that plays along with it. So of course, you know, neutrophils are white blood cells. There's, they literally just took blood from a graduate student, <laughs> stuck it on a microscope spread, slide. A so that's red blood cells, red right? Blood cells. Here's the neutrophil, which moves like an amoeba. Here are some staphylococci bacteria, which are non-modal, right? No round boats, y'all, in lab, right? But this is liquid, right? It's blood. So it kind of bounces around due to thermal energy. And the neutrophil is literally chasing it because, trust me, this guy smells bad. You guys in lab know this too, right? They produce chemicals. They can't help it, right? The neutrophil senses it, and he chases it until eventually... He engulfs it by phagocytosis. Probably one of the best videos out there, though, for phagocytosis, right? If you just search amoeba, because that's pretty much how they eat, and they'll eat paramecium. This one, I'm actually glad the audio won't work on it right now, because, <laughs> like, there's a bunch of screaming kids in the background. Uh, <laughs> but, y'all, look at this. That's the amoeba. Here's the two paramecium. They literally surround it in a vesicle, right? And then they have other vesicles that contain digestive enzymes, right? And look, the poor amoeba watch. They realize they're trapped. They're like, oh crap, we're trying to get out of here. And they can't, right? They're stuck in this vesicle, right? They're membrane bound. And then look, they're starting to turn into mush. That's because the enzymes have been dumped on them, and they're getting digested. So basically, you know, you're looking at the stomach of a, an amoeba, right? The same thing happens inside of our white blood cells. Well, these guys are cool too, but we don't have time for them. Right, so there's more videos, right, um, that show you, right, the movement of them and and talk about that and they're really cool so definitely check them out um, but yeah we don't have time for that <laughs> I don't have time for the fun stuff okay so phagocytosis we need to know the steps in this process right um, so you need to either put them in order if I ask you a little piece you need to know right uh, in, in pretty good detail. And then the other thing we're going to talk about that's related to this is respiratory burst. So as it implies respiration, we usually think about oxygen, right? And we've already talked about how oxygen can be toxic. Those cells, those phagocytic cells, will actually purposely make toxic forms of oxygen and dump it on the bacteria in those vesicles to kill them. Okay? But it, we do it in a safe way, right? Because a vesicle is a membrane-bound compartment inside of our cells. So we don't hurt us. We hurt the bacteria that's inside that vesicle. Okay? So the very first thing, as we said already, for phagocytosis to happen is that we've got to recognize it, right? It either be, has to be opsonized or our pattern recognition receptors on these cells have to recognize it and bind to a receptor. That's going to induce endocytosis, where literally the membrane is going to surround the bacteria or the virus or, right, or some foreign protein. This, this vesicle becomes um, acidic, right? We'll actually dump hydrogen ions on it. This vesicle, because it's phagocytosis and it's a phagocytic cell, whether it be a neutrophil or a macrophage or a monocyte, right? It's called a phagosome. That phagosome becomes a light, a phagolysosome when guess what? The lysosomes that contain things like lysozyme fuse with it and literally dump, like this is when you see that those poor amoeba getting killed, right? 
and we're going to that's going to allow us to digest right the bad guy and then we literally spit it out by exocytosis where this membrane will fuse with the cell's membrane and will throw out the trash okay some cells will do one step further and, and we'll talk about that later but this is the basis of phagocytosis so neutrophils do this monocytes do this macrophages do this right this process so again we've talked about this right how is it that we still get sick if we can eat these guys well can we recognize every bacteria no capsules guess what did I say anything about a pattern recognition receptor for capsules no damn it we need to <laughs> wish we had one but we don't right so a lot of pathogenic bacteria have capsules and they right here we don't even phagocytic cells don't even bind to them so phagocytosis of them doesn't even happen unless we've got like say an antibody that opsonizes them and then we can recognize them so some of them don't even get into the cell some of them once they get inside the phagosome right they're like they can stop the acidification process they can stop lysosomes from fusing they make this their own little home what causes tuberculosis mycobacteria that causes tuberculosis and causes leprosy by the way they'll grow inside your macrophages inside that phagosome because they stop they can shut down the mechanism of destruction so they hide inside of our cells other ones like Shigella and other ones like they'll purposely get inside your cell and then they use the actin in your cell and they shoot out of the cell. They literally escape. Right? So, yeah, this is an awesome process, but it doesn't work for every bacteria or virus or foreign protein that gets in. But when it works, it's pretty awesome, right? We can destroy the invaders. So what's in those lysosomes? They're named after the fact that obviously a lot of times they have lysozyme, which degrades peptidoglycan, right? The cell wall, this is unique to bacteria. It'll contain proteases, as the name implies. These are protein, these are enzymes that digest proteins. Defensins, we've talked about these before, right? These are proteins or or amino acid peptides that will insert into microbial membranes, right? Especially some bacteria. The other thing they'll do is they'll make hydrogen peroxide. <laughs> they'll make uh, hypochlorite. Anyone know what that is commonly referred to in your house? It's bleach. That's bleach, right? We make bleach in our cells to kill bacteria. Hence why it'll kill bacteria. We make hydroxide radicals, right? Notice all these have oxygen in them. Hence why it's referred to as res respiratory burst, right? We make superoxide anions and nitric oxide, and we dump it on them to kill them. Because we're mean like that. <laughs> Sometimes you're dealing with stuff that's too big for phagocytes to engulf, right? And that's when eosinophils, basophils, and basophils' close cousin mast cells, which are in your tissues, right? Eosinophils and basophils, we talked about being in your blood, right? Mast cells are found in your tissues. They're very similar to basophils. These guys have granules, right? instead of engulfing something they instead release the contents of their granules into the area onto say the parasitic worm right or certain fungi so they literally in this process of course is called degranulization right because they're granules right and they're going to die in this process right so there's a mast cell that would be in your tissue, right? See all these round things, right? Other than the nucleus, these are granules packed full, right? Of digestive enzymes, right? And so they're releasing them, in this case, onto a, who knows what, looks like a bacteria to me. 
But there's those eosinophils I was talking about under the microscope. See the purple nucleus, but kind of reddish, right? And if you look real close, they're little round, right, vesicles. And then basophil, see how it, I said it's all purple? But you see how it's very granular looking? Okay. Mast cells are cousins to the basophils, right? This is a different stain, right? Um, otherwise, they would stain purple too. Uh, these are in your tissues. They also have granules that are similar to what's inside basophils. Basophils and mast cells are the ones that contain things like histamine. So in addition to killing what's nearby, they'll elicit inflammation, right? So look, I took all the words away, right? So you can look at the pictures and walk through, right, as you're studying and uh, see if you can remember the important steps of that process. So um, I should have printed this one out for you guys. I meant to, but I didn't. Um, but look at some of these I didn't label. It's in your book. These are important receptors that we're going to talk about next time. Okay? So notice this red one is on all of these cells, right? So they, they've got this cell, but it's actually divided into this represents a neutrophil, this represents a natural killer cell, one of your epithelial cells, uh, a macrophage or a dendritic cell, B cell, and T cells, right? So look in your book, right? Because if you write these things down, and I start talking about these receptors, hopefully you remember them. And I'll go over them. Okay. So natural killer cells, which falls into the category of lymphocytes, um, but they're not part of our adaptive immune response. Um, so who do they target? And their name says a lot, right? They naturally kill. So they're going to kill somebody, but who are they going to kill? Um, they're very useful in that, unlike the T cells and the B cells that we're going to look at next time that literally have receptors for antigen, natural killer cells don't have specific receptors for specific antigens, right? So they definitely fall into the innate immune response. They will eliminate host cells, right? Um, that have been invaded, right, that aren't displaying normal characteristics, right? So they're kind of your survey cells. They walk around and they survey your cells. They don't, they don't kill by phagocytosis, right? Instead, they're going to dump, again, digestive enzymes, different things that are going to cause that cell to die. Right, so they release perforin, which pokes holes in the membrane. They're going to release granzymes, which induce apoptosis, um, cell suicide, right? And this won't elicit inflammation. And so they're also useful, right, for abnormal cells or, or cancerous cells. And I don't have the picture I want, okay? Um, so the other thing they do and, and how they can do this is, remember, our cells have receptors on their surface, right? So this receptor, notice, is found in all the cells. This is kind of like your cell's ID, right? They're called major histocompatibility. And we found out about these when we tried to do transplants for people, right? <laughs> we tried to give them other people's organs. Well, the problem is, is that this kind of ID tag wasn't the same. And so the immune system couldn't, one, communicate with these cells, and natural killer cells saw these cells as foreign, right? That's how they got their name. There's two classes. This is class one. It's found on all your cells. So the only person in this world, which most of us don't have this person, that would be exact genetic match to you, where your MHCs would match 100%, would be who? 
who would be I who be genetically identical to you and trust me you were born at the same time your identical twin because an identical twin is a sperm and an egg that combine and at some point in the process split into two individuals your twins because you shared the womb at the same time fraternal and you'd be the same sex right because again you were the same egg and sperm somewhere in the beginning Fraternal, on the other hand, means that mommy dropped two or more eggs. <laughs> you shared the womb at the same time, but those two eggs, trust me, were fertilized by two different sperm, which is why you could have fraternal twins that are male and female, right? And can look completely different from one another, right? Because you are. You are two separate eggs and sperm. You just happen to share the womb at the same time, hence why you're called a twin. So who's got an identical twin? Ooh, lucky you, right? So you've got, you know, someone who would maybe be willing to give you an organ if you needed it, right? Like a kidney. Uh, it's the only one where you get two because it's so important, right? You can spare one and give it to someone else and still live. Otherwise, the identical twin must die. You probably don't want that to happen, okay? Um, we haven't gotten to the level of cloning people, right? right those sci-fi movies right that'd be kind of crazy anyways um so what happens is usually some family members close enough right that your immune system isn't going to attack but people who get organ transports and if we transplant an organ to you you need it to live right we're not going to just do it to do it <laughs> okay um you will be on immunosuppressive drugs for the rest of your life to keep your immune system from attacking that organ you won't work in a daycare. You won't go to most of the festivals anymore, right? Because what did I just say? We're going to give you immunosuppressant drugs for the rest of your life. That puts you at risk for what? Infection, right? And daycares are like little germs walking around, right? That's what little kids are because they have no idea what hygiene is, right? Okay? Any place where there's a large number of people, you increase, right? your likelihood of getting sick. So unfortunately, you avoid those places, but you're happy to be alive, right? Because without that organ, you wouldn't be alive, right? Make sense? So we're gonna talk about these markers in more detail. So definitely take a look at it if you can. Um, write them out, right? This diagram's in your book. So the other thing that natural killers will do is any cell that's not displaying this marker, it will kill it. So why wouldn't you display that, right? This is, this is like the ID card for your cells. All your cells display this, right? Some viruses, because this is one of the ways that our cells say, hey, look at what's inside of me. They literally use MHC to pick up the foreign antigens and display it on the surface. Well, that virus doesn't want to get detected, does it? So some of them have evolved a way to shut down this mechanism. So when the natural killer cell comes along and your cell is basically not showing its ID card, natural killer cell says, um, something's wrong here, right? So much so that it's going to kill that cell, right? If that cell is not behaving normally, right, not presenting MHC class 1, right, or presenting things that are bad, that natural killer cell is going to kill it. And then when we look at antibody responses with a certain class of antibody, IgG, if a cell is coded in that, a natural killer cell has a receptor for that antibody and will kill that cell, right? But that's basically because a cell has been opsonized by an antibody, right? That's a special type of antibody response known as antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity so natural killer cells naturally kill right um, but they need help to do that they need to have some type of way of knowing that the cell isn't normal right um, they specifically don't know what's wrong with the cell they just know the cell's not behaving normally right it's not displaying its normal markers like MHC right or it's coded in antibody right, IgG antibody to be specific, right, um, 
It doesn't know exactly what's wrong, but it knows something's wrong and that cell needs to be eliminated. So how are we doing on time? Woohoo! So go ahead and um, I'll activate it. Let's 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 do um, the poll and.